Hey, this is me building a $3 million a year business in public. The way these videos always go is I start with some YouTube comment Q&A, and this is me just answering all the questions that you guys ask at the comment section of all of my videos. Reason why is because it gives it back to you, delivers immediate value, and then it's also a growth hack for me. Makes my channel grow faster. This is uh, growth stats across YouTube, Instagram, and products. You guys could see how I'm making almost $400,000 a month with uh, the variety of the things that I'm doing. Then finally, I chat daily business improvements. Today, I'm going to be doing a Maker School exclusive. This is my main channel here at 135,000 subs. This is my daily updates channel. Uh, I just scroll down to the bottom and I answer the oldest question. So today, the oldest one is from Ali Furman. He says, hey, Nick, you make great content. It's almost exactly what I'm looking for. No BS shiny looking thing, but actual use cases and useful things that businesses need. Thank you. How do you decide which business processes are worth automating with AI? Do you perform an audit? I guess it's targeting most revenue potential and fastest development time, but what checklist or process do you follow when evaluating the automation potential of a process within a business? I'd be great if you could walk us through your decision-making process. Also, what are your top three most requested or recurring automation solutions you build for other businesses? I can bang this one out um, ASAP. It's a cold email, my proposal generator, and then some sort of like one-click CRM, just based off CRM templates that people have seen uh, that I've shown with uh, One Second Copy in my previous copywriting business. Okay, so uh, in terms of the checklist, I just do... Something like this. This is an automation agency uh, sales skeleton. Basically, instead of me doing like a whole uh, script, which I find just very difficult to deliver in a natural and organic sounding way, what I do is I just give a skeleton, which is just a basically a big list of things that I talk to, uh, I talk about. So I start by building some rapport, then I set the schedule, and then the big question I ask is why me now in this. And the reason why is because if you just ask why now, then the vast majority of the time, the person on the other end, while you're doing some sort of audit or, or sales call or whatever, just gives you all of the ammunition that you need in order to sell them. Like, why me? Well, because I really need X, Y, and Z. I really love that you talked about X, Y, and Z, and I think that you're the best person to help us solve X, Y, and Z. And it's like, all right, cool. Now I know everything I need in order to sell you. Okay, now, in terms of the um, actual... Uh, questions I ask for in an audit, it's always the customer journey from the start to the end of the fulfillment. That's the most important thing. When I say customer journey from start to end of fulfillment, I mean, like, where is a customer seeing you for the very first time? Are you running some sort of Facebook inbound lead ad? If so, the very first time the customer interacts with you or your company, it's not like when they get in the call with you, it's when they see the Facebook lead ad. It's the fact that they're scrolling through Facebook, probably while shoving popcorn in their mouth and playing YouTube videos in the background or whatever. Then they come across your little ad creative, they click the button, they, they enter the form. If you get most of your clients through referrals, where they first meet you is in an email thread where somebody else is saying, hey, you know, there is somebody I know that could help you with this. If you get your clients through cold email, it's obviously through a cold email, okay, in their email inbox as well. If it's cold calling, it's, you know, the first time they interact with you is on the phone, right? So I, I start all the way at the very beginning, and then I work all the way through all of the steps of the business. And there are a lot of steps, to be clear. Like, you know, if this is your lead gen, after lead gen, there is the actual sales process. What do I mean by sales process? I mean, so how are you taking a lead, you know, a Facebook inbound lead, and then converting that to a sales call? Well, immediately after we call them. Okay, what happens after you call them? Well, we send them a calendar link. Okay, great. So what happens after the calendar link? All right, well, sometimes they book, sometimes they don't. Okay, what happens when they book? This happens. What happens when they don't book? This happens. We go through literally every step of their entire business. Likewise, um, how do you close the deal, right? So, um, you know, how do they become your client? Uh, oh, I don't know. We send them a... Um, proposal and after they sign that we send them an agreement and after they sign that we send them an invoice it's like hmm, what happens if they don't do any of those three steps what do you do onboarding it's like how do you guys do the onboarding how do you transition them from somebody that is not a client into a client then it's like okay what about the fulfillment likewise what do you do after the fulfillment is there some sort of like post thing that you do how do you uh uh you know retain the client right how do you how do you get them back into your business oh you don't do any of that all right cool so if you just run the customer through that series and you just have them map out their pipeline from start to finish, you will usually know everything you need to know in order to make a, a reasonable um, um, analysis, I would say, of their main bottlenecks and problems. Another question you can ask is what is your revenue per employee uh, or cost per employee? Or if they have mostly contractors, it's like cost per contractor. Basically like, you know, amount of money that the business is making per staff member. So I'll give you an example. When I made over $100,000 a month with my business um, and I had just me, my RPE, if you want to call it that, was $100,000. Most other businesses have RPEs of like $15,000, $20,000. A lot, 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 lot lower. So you figuring this out, 
gets to kind of map this helps you kind of map them you know from like super high rp like me to like pretty low shitty rp like you know most other businesses and the lower the rp the more you can systematize the business the higher the rp the, the trickier it's going to be to do that and then obviously some sales history questions okay so that's what i ask personally that's my checklist if i had one Domin Rubin says, hey, Nick, I had a question about how to secure my end and cloud workflows and webhooks. Some of my clients want me to sign an NDA, and I'm not sure if I'd be held responsible if somebody hacks in my end and infrastructure. Love your content, by the way. Cheers. I got to be honest, man. I'm not the guy to ask for this stuff. Um, I don't work in industries that worry about stuff like this specifically because it's just a pain in my ass. So if I had a client wanting to sign an NDA about hacking or something like that, um, you know, I'd, I'd let them know that like, hey, nothing in life is secure. And uh, I've never had this ever happen to me before. Um, and I've, I'm very, it's very unlikely that this is going to happen. But uh, the fact that we're discussing this problem, unless you're a billion dollar company or something is probably illogical, and we should be focusing our efforts elsewhere. And if they don't like that answer, then we don't have to work together. I guess what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of much easier pickings than clients that are worried about, you know, some potential hacking risk. So how secure are they? I don't know, man. You got to talk to NNN for that. You know, you're probably going to be held responsible, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, you could probably make a case that NNN is responsible, but it's also kind of like it's, it's like the Equifax hack, right? It's like 23andMe hack. You know, it's like who's really responsible for that? At the end of the day, you're always responsible for giving them your data in some way, shape, or form. Max Kruger says, how'd you learn AI automation if you had zero dollars to start? Uh, great question. I would, I would watch all of my own tutorials. So the Make Money with Make playlist and then the NADN full course playlists that I have set up. Um, well, not playlists, but like compilations. Um, simplest and easiest way to like get up and running with the technical skills. I had to also watch a few of my business videos. So there's like the 80-20, 80% 80 um, of automation basics in less than an hour or something like that. I watched that. I watch a prompt engineering video as well. Um, that's like the you know 80-20 curriculum that I would give you. Uh, once you know that, you, you actually get out there and you start making you know Upwork applications, sending emails, sending cold DMs, reactivating your network if you're running a previous business, um, you know, making community posts and so on and so on and so forth. So basically, you got to like put yourself in front of customers as much as humanly possible. It doesn't even matter uh, what your skill levels are. Abdul says, when I use the Appify Apollo Scraper, I only get 100 leads. What is this happening to me? Is this a problem with the scraper? No, this isn't a problem with the scraper. You just... Um, you don't have a paid account and because you don't have a paid account that's not it's just not allowing you to you know scrape more than 100 if you want a paid account um i have a code you know it just ran out actually so that won't work i am going to get another discount code for appify fingers crossed unless they hate me for whatever reason i don't see why they would i've made them probably hundreds of thousands of dollars now uh and then i'll share it with with you guys here on the daily updates channel and then also in my community so yeah um the second that you pay it's like you're basically buying a bunch of credits it's not like you're spending money and then you know taking that and then spending more money on the leads it's like just like credits that you exchange dollars for and then you just work through your credit balance so it's not like you spend any more money if your lead uh volume is at a certain point they just want to make sure you're not like spamming them and stuff okay lines legacy says um nick how was your school life have you been bullied are you a topper student what advices would you give to your past self i find school way boring what'd you do if you're in school right now how would you manage school with an ai biz please help yeah we get a lot of um a lot of young kids that are uh you know getting into AI automation which i wish that i had dove into earlier so how was my school life it was good no major issues was i bullied I mean, mildly, like most other children are, but nothing major. Was I a topper student? I imagine that means like really high grades. Um, yeah, it was pretty good grades, I would say. You know, probably like top 10%. I wasn't like the best at everything. I actually struggled a little bit with math, um, which is unfortunate. And that's one of the reasons why. Uh, it's actually like kind of the, the reason why I got really disillusioned with school was just because of the way that they taught math. And then when I got out of school, I started like watching YouTube videos about math and I was like, wow, this is incredible. Math is actually like amazing and it's so freaking interesting. But the way that it was taught, it was the most boring, dry, regurgitated bullshit on planet Earth. It's also where I got the concept of there being like academic and technical people versus like effective people. And academic and technical people are very rarely effective. My math teacher, for instance, he was extraordinarily academic, extraordinarily technical, and probably one of the smartest guys on not planet earth but very very intelligent man you know what i mean um he was one of the least effective people i've ever seen in my life at doing his job so you don't have to be a smart technical extraordinarily gifted person to be effective and that's what ultimately matters in our economy being effective my math teacher was smart as hell probably made 70k a year you know what i mean 
Canadian, which is like 50k USD, maybe even less. So yeah, my advice um, to my past self, uh, skip school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> skip school, do drugs. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I skipped the vast majority of my university. Uh, so yeah, uh, they started recording lectures and stuff like that right around the time that uh, I got in, which was really, really useful. And then they started like including them after the, the, the lecture. So I just wouldn't go to the lecture. And then I would just like get on the mailing list for the thing. Or I'd have a friend send, send over the recording and then I just watch it at like 2x speed. Um, if only AI transcription tools were available back then, I would have just transcribed them and then I would have used GPT to create my own notes and then I just would have studied those notes. I probably could have done an entire eight hour school day in like 30 minutes. That's just how bloated and pointless they are. Oscarito says, thanks for responding. I appreciate it. Going to start commenting a lot more so the algo catches on that 1% better. Let's Oh man, right now I don't have the budget to join Maker School, but once I land a few clients, and I know I will, I'm going to join just for the network and to be a closer part of the community. Like really, we're doing sustainably valuable. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Got another great question from Tristan. Hey, Nick, love your content. Been setting up my agency for the last couple of months. Actually, just about to install my first automation for a popular wedding band over here in Scotland. They're on a free trial for six weeks, and if they like it, we're going to go to a monthly plan. It's a system that receives all their inquiries, generates a quote, and makes a draft email for them. I suggested it purely from watching Instagram stories where they're saying, we're sorry for the slow responses. Nice. So you did some sort of outbound Instagram approach. Fantastic work. That's killer. I'm going to save them at least 15 hours a week. My question is when it comes to pricing, how do I justify my price or where should I even start? So you said free trial for six weeks. And then if we like it, we're going to go to a monthly plan. I'll be honest, this is not a good way to pitch the automations. You've done it. So you could, you're going to have to live with it. Why in the bed that you made? But um, think about it from their perspective. Uh, this is like a fear-based thing because you get them used to using a system for six weeks and then you say i'm going to take it away unless you pay i don't really like operating that way i prefer people obviously to like fall in love with the value so much that they want to pay me hand over fist so the way that i would do this is i would offer some sort of system build for free and then i would actually say um, only if you absolutely love it would i ever ask you to pay for it and then i'd make them love it so much that the natural question would be like hey nick how can i pay you and i would actually have them start that conversation with me i wouldn't do it at the end of a six-week period or whatever and in terms of pricing you know it's hard it's hard to say i don't know how much money were they making before how much money are they making with the system what's the opportunity cost the leads that they're missing how much more money do you think they'd be making uh with the system versus without the system how much time do you think you'd be saving them um add all of this up into some sort of like value uh, a number and then charge maybe you know a third maybe a quarter of that i would say uh 15 hours a week is one thing of savings right but like it's not just about the savings of time like there's actually a lot more that goes into the value of a system right so time if you'll notice the way i listed the, the value back there time was one of the last things i mentioned right like 15 hours a week at even like 50 bucks an hour that's only 750 bucks a week but because we got back to three more leads this week and the average lead vo uh, volume lead value is a thousand dollars that's $3,000, which is 4x this. And this is usually like a 4x differential, I would say, between the front end and the back end. Thank you, Builders Tutorials. Thank you, Teculay. Much appreciated. Okay, I think I'll leave it there. Um, yeah. Hopefully this makes sense. Let's now do some brand stats, shall we? Okay, so brand stats, June the 17th today. Going to head over to my main channel. 135,876. So we've gone up by 618. Now, this isn't entirely accurate because uh, I would have done the daily updates in a couple of hours. So my growth rate is probably not actually slowed down to 0.46%. It's probably it's still about 0.5%. Just got to do this early today because I got a call for the community in uh, 24 minutes. Daily updates channel here has gone up by 40. And then blast up my Instagram. It's gone by 214,047. So that's gained 1,302. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so um, that's growth on that front. I'll check out Maker School. Maker School seems to be the churn anyway. Um, is not impacting MRR yet, although you know we're going to drop below three hundred seven probably. Uh, but the churn is now at twenty three percent. So these are probably the delayed effects that I was mentioning to you guys before yesterday, where you know this is the churn rising, and then this is where I think the churn is going to go. I spotted the churn problem right here. And then I started acting against the churn problem right over here. But that was a few days ago, so we still have to wait a little while for my efforts to start pushing this down. So I don't think we're going to see the results of this for a few days yet, which is unfortunate, but... Um, yeah, I just got to make it abundantly clear that I'm going to be uh, delivering massive amounts of value. 
53, uh, it's just everything I know about focus. Okay, cool. So yeah, this, this posted really well, right? We got 135 comment, uh, likes, 94 comments, um, tons of value to the group, and it was about an hour. I just have to make another one. So today, uh, are these my community exclusives? No, they're not. I will do this. Uh, no, actually, I've already done this. So I just need to refresh this basically constantly and, and constantly be delivering new value. I also need to read you maker school uh, first week, uh, sorry, first month of maker school. So sorry, where is this? I don't even know. All oh, right. Uh, no, maker school exclusive shit. I don't even remember where this is. Pardon my French. Uh, was it a Google sheet? I don't remember actually. Brand stats. Scripts for Nick? No. Maker School Post Schedule? That's probably a writer. That's it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, 17th, right over here. How to build a content creation engine, get 120,000 subs, make that 135,000 subs. And I'm just going to run through my entire content strategy from start to finish today. Uh, I'm going to map that out and I'm going to give it to everybody. So, that's going to be pretty cool. I'm pretty excited about that. Speaking of which, what is my entire content strategy? Um, hmm. I guess there are two or three components to this. From a bird's eye view, I should probably cover the idea. Okay, let's just scroll all the way down here and I'll just do some bullet points. Um, um, da, 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 da. Why don't we go over here? Well, let's copy this. Let's copy this. Oh, nope. Paste that in there. Couple things. So, my past attempts at starting a YouTube channel. The pivotal switch. Production time to posted time. And my uh, avoiding ADHD style content and going and maximizing for production time to posted time ratio. Publishing, recording first, worrying about where I land later, key concept. If you're good, maximize surface area, that should be a good concept. Um, planning, versus feedback. Always favor the latter. And then um, go my progress over time, various mishaps, ETC, and then transitioning from solo to team, team, plus my whole approach step by step behind the scenes. Okay, and I'm just gonna give everybody everything. Just like I always have. That's the way to do it. Okay, cool. This is going to be everything. And what I'm gonna do is I will open up a bunch of tabs before I record this that will show my YouTube history I'll see if I could show a previous examples of videos I've made. I don't know if I have them because when my old YouTube channel got taken down, it was banned um, for explicit content. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, then I'll chat a little bit about that mental model of recording first, worrying about where I land later, and then the concept of planning versus feedback, and then my progress over time, all the mishaps that I made so people can avoid them. And then I'll talk about modern, transitioning from a solo to a content team, plus my whole approach, the step-by-step -step and behind the scenes. That sounds good to me. That sounds really good to me. I'm excited to see where I land with that. Also, I think this will be a really good, valuable piece of content for everybody to see. So if you guys want to see probably another half an hour to an hour long step-by-step -step breakdown of everything that I know about YouTube and then how to build a brand and so on and so forth, including all of my step-by-steps, then um, definitely check out Maker School. Okay, I'll leave it there. I got to prep for the uh, weekly community call. Have a lovely rest of the day.